Hey guys, Jake Carlson here, host of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Are you ready to focus on amplifying your leadership superpowers? Let's go. Good morning to you, fellow achievers and friends. So good to be back behind the microphone and hanging out with you today. It's a great day. You know what word I love? Prolific. I don't know why. I hear it. I like it. But do you know what it means? Well, I had to Google it. It means marked by abundant inventiveness and productivity. Sounds important, right? Well, today's guest literally wrote a book with a step-by-step process for being prolific, brilliant, and healthy in life and work. I am thrilled to welcome one of my favorite authors, Todd Henry, to the podcast. Todd is a superstar successful author who next month releases his fourth game-changing book, Hurting Tigers. His first book, The Accidental Creative, How to Be Brilliant at a Moment's Notice, is this month's Modern Leadership Book Club Deep Dive and the reason I invited Todd to join us. Todd is the host of The Accidental Creative Podcast and a self-proclaimed arms dealer for the creative revolution. He writes and speaks on creativity, productivity, and passion for work, so basically, being brilliant. Todd, it is incredible to have you on the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Jake. Thanks for having me. You know, it's so fun to have you on the show because you write about topics that are near and dear to me, things that I study in my free time, things that I love to dive into. And truly, we should have a three-hour episode here because I would love to talk (laughs) about your other three books, Die Empty, Louder Than Words, and this new one, Hurting Tigers, but alas, our time is short, and there is so much in this book, Accidental Creative. It's our book club book for this month. All of our listeners are reading it and following along with you. So let's start with the beginning. How did you come up with this idea? Take us back to how you knew this was a book that needed to be written. Well, so I I kind of cut my teeth leading creative teams, um, and so I was perpetually struggling with how do not only how do I personally stay inspired and how do I personally organize my focus and my time and my energy to help me be prolific, brilliant and healthy. But how do I do that for my team? And so um, over the course of, of many years, I actually experimented a lot, tried a lot of different things and seemed to stumble upon uh, uh, some, some things that worked really well. And uh, so I started sharing those things in 2005 in the form of a podcast. Um, so the podcast now, the Axon Creative Podcast has been going for 12 years um, or almost 12 years. And so I started sharing some of those and immediately uh, right out of the gate, and, and I, I didn't intend for this to happen, but right out of the gate, there were you know, thousands of people listening to the show, which to me indicated, okay, I'm not the only one wrestling with this. It seems like a lot of other people are looking for a path here to help them deal with the pressure of the create on demand world. And so uh, you know, the podcast over the course of time continued to grow and had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with companies and hear what was working for them and and to go out and to, to share some of these best practices and then and then in uh, 2009, was approached by uh, by a literary agent who said, "Hey, I, th- I think there's a book here, and this would you be interested in that?" And so we worked on a book proposal, and and then we showed it to Portfolio, um, who was my publisher. They publish all of my books, and uh, it's an imprint of Penguin. And they immediately said, "Yeah, this is definitely a book. We definitely want to do this." So that was kind of how the accidental creative came to be. Uh, it was really just the result of a lot of years of exploring and trying to figure out what seems to help people in the midst of the creative on demand world to position themselves not to just be living hand to mouth, which is what a lot of creative pros do. Uh, it's, you know, go to work and crank it out. And then the next day I get up and I go to work and I crank it out. But how can you develop a deep reservoir of, of focus, of energy and, and manage your time, not just for efficiency, but for effectiveness so that you're positioned to deliver results when it matters most. And that was really kind of the core of, of the message. And fortunately, it's really resonated well, and it seems to be really helping a lot of people. Yeah, and you have a great writing style. I was not aware that this was 12-year podcast in the making here, and I want to talk to you a little bit about that. But before we do, I want to define this creatives for our audience here because sometimes when we hear the term creative, we think of, you know, I'm, I'm dealing in art, I'm dealing in writing, maybe I'm a podcaster, but that's not necessarily all creatives. That's right. Yeah, I, I define creativity as problem solving. If you solve problems as a function of your job, then you are required to be creative every day. And so, you know, obviously we think of artists, artists are solving a problem by creating a work of art. 
that's how that you know a designer designs something to solve a problem to meet a client's needs. But you know, a manager of an organization, regardless of the kind of organization, I mean, you're developing systems, you're solving personnel problems, you're trying to help clients define and figure out you know wh- what they need for for their needs. Uh, and, and so you you are solving problems on a regular basis, and you are privy to all of the same pressures and forces that a an artist is in their job. It's just that the output is very different. So if you solve problems problems on a regular basis, you are a creative professional. And as a result, you need to be mindful of how you structure your life so that you can deliver those results when it matters. And this applies even to attorneys. I got to tell you that at the time you were starting your podcast, I was finishing law school on a creative problem-solving scholarship. So even lawyers have to be creative problem solvers, or at least my school thought that it was worth paying a student to come and go to school for that. So I, I love that. One of the quotes from your book that I want to talk about for a minute here is, we treat our creative process like a household appliance. It's just expected to work. And I want to talk to that for just a minute. Yeah, I, th- I think that we take our creativity for granted. I do. I think that... Uh, because the process is mysterious, because we don't know where ideas come from, really, it's hard to trace back exactly what was the source of that insight or that aha moment. We, we tend to ascribe it to um, some sort of mystical force that lives out there and occasionally converges and we say, oh, great, I've got an idea. But we really think it's beyond our ability to control. And to some extent, that's true. To some extent, we cannot force creativity. And also, you have to take into account talent. There are some people who are just naturally gifted. They just naturally seem to be able to make connections. But really, that's what creativity is. It's making connections. It's connecting dots that seem non-intuitive on the surface, but once you dive a couple of layers deeper, you start to realize, oh, these things are actually connected and they help me solve the problem I'm trying to solve. And so we can, we can't force creativity, but we can create an environment in which creative accidents are more likely to happen. And I call creative, I I call uh, creative accidents is the term I use for when two things come together that don't seem like they belong together and you go, wait a minute, that's brilliant. That actually solves the problem. So we can create environments in which those things are more likely to happen than not. Um, But the problem is that we often are less than intentional about our disciplines, about our practices, about how we structure our life and our work, how we define problems, how we manage our energy, how we uh, develop relationships so that they're stimulating and inspiring, or frankly, how we fail to develop relationships so they begin to drag us down emotionally and creatively. So we, we don't we don't look at the system around the problem. We just think, well, creativity is I'm a really talented person and I come and I stare at the problem and suddenly I have a breakthrough. Well, no, that's not really the way it is. And when I looked at the artists and the really talented, prolific creatives in my midst when I was leading creative people, they all had some rituals. They all had some mechanisms that they used to help them stay inspired or to help them structure their life or, uh, you know, and they just thought it was something that, you know, well, this is just a habit I picked up in design school or this is just something that I I read that this other designer did, so I started doing it too. And they just thought it was kind of a, you know, a, a, an unintentional sort of um, haphazard thing they were doing, but it was actually very formalized, you know, in their world, and it was actually helping them uh, approach their work in, in a better way. So um, as I sort of listened and figured out what is it that seems to be working, that's when these patterns kind of emerged. And I think that's a great setup for diving into the book because the way you have the book organized about the first quarter as you get into it is basically the dynamics, talking about what is creativity and developing these strategies. But then the the final three quarters is really this creative rhythm. It's these rituals. It's these things that we can do to create creativity in our life or to stimulate creativity in our life. And so for the Next part of this podcast, I just want to dive into a couple of sections that you have in the book. Of course, the the listeners need to pick up the book and read it because you've done so much research and you're such a great storyteller. But I want to start you off with reminding you of this story of Snowmageddon. And in one of the <laughs> chapters on energy, you talk about your neighbors and each of your neighbors had a different strategy for handling the snow. As the snow would come down, you had one neighbor who would kind of shovel every couple of inches, you know, go out throughout the day and and keep the the walk kind of clear. The second neighbor would wait until all the snow came down and then go out and shovel this. And you talk about this in your chapter on energy, your invisible ally. And I want to see how this story of Snowmageddon relates to creatives. 
Yeah. So I think one of the, one of the challenges that we have is that, um, we are being pulled in a million different directions every day. We have, uh, expectations, we have problems to solve, and those problems weigh on us. And so it's really easy, really tempting for us to be, um, to, to allow ourselves to get pulled into a rhythm of just constant exertion of energy. And that that's kind of how I, you know, sort of the corollary to the 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 person, the neighbor who goes out every every inch or two that, that falls and goes out and just sort of shovels and, and you know, is trying to keep the, uh, the sidewalk perfectly clear versus the person who says, you know what, I'm going to wait until the snow is finished. And then I'll go out and I'll exert energy and I'll I'll clear my my driveway, but it's not going to occupy you know, all of my energy and all of my effort um, throughout the course of my day. I'm not going to be interrupting everything I'm doing. And so, you know, energy management becomes a really important thing. We tend to think if we have the time, the physical time available for us, that we can do something. But the reality is that we can yes, have the physical time available. If we don't have the energy available, then we're not going to be able to expend what, what has come to be called emotional labor, right? And this is a phrase that Seth Godin has used and others have used to talk about the necessary uh, the necessary energy that you bring to the project that allows you to put something unique into it, to put yourself into it. Instead, you're going to be a shadow of yourself if you don't have the energy necessary to be able to bring your full effort to that. And so you can stack meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting, and you get to the end of the day, and you've been very efficient all day, but you've got nothing left to give. And so you're in the meeting, you need an idea. Well, I've got, I've got nothing. I got nothing for you because I haven't been managing my energy as well as my time. And so with energy management, the thing we have to keep in mind is energy is about rhythm. Energy is about having peaks and troughs. Uh, and it's also about being very mindful of how you layer commitments onto yourself because every little commitment that you make requires energy from you. It doesn't matter if it's in your work or your personal life or where it is. Every commitment you make requires energy. Every problem you're tasked with solving requires some bit of latent energy that's operating just beneath the surface that maybe you're not even aware of because your mind is constantly cycling, constantly trying to solve problems. So one of the ways I like to think about this is, you know, one of the one of the primary roles of a vine keeper in a vineyard is to regularly prune areas of new growth off of the vine. Perfectly good fruit. Why would you prune perfectly good fruit off of a growing vine? Well, it's because the vine keeper knows if that new fruit isn't regularly pruned, it will eventually begin to steal resources from the older, more mature fruit-bearing parts of the vine. And over time, the entire vine will succumb to systemic mediocrity because there are only so many resources to go around. So the vine can bear either a lot of mediocre fruit or a little bit of really good fruit. So we have to be mindful of that in our own lives. I think you know, we squeeze things in because we think we have the time. Well, I have the time to do it. I can dedicate an hour to that. Sure, I can do it. But we fail to account for the energy necessary to do it well. So we're doing a lot of things, but we're doing a lot of things in a very mediocre way because we're not pruning, because we're not willing to say, yes, that's a good thing. And I'm going to say no to that good thing because I know there's something better I need to be working on. And there are a lot of reasons we do this fear of missing out. You know, well, we, we look at what other people are doing and we say, well, I want some of that. I want to do that. I want to be a part of it, right? And we and we look around. We look at we we your peripheral vision is a blessing and a curse because we can look to the left and right and we can kind of see how we're pacing and we can see, you know, what the opportunities are out there. But the problem, the curse part of it is we can very easily look into somebody else's lane. Uh, you know, like we're thinking about a racetrack. We can look in somebody else's lane and wherever we look is where our body is going to go. So we can easily drift off course and begin trying to do things that aren't a part of who we are or what we're really trying to do in the world. We can get distracted very easily. And pretty soon we're doing a thousand little things that we never – intended to do simply because we got distracted and we failed to prune. And so that can look like, uh, you know, recurring meetings that can look like projects that we take on that we think, oh, well, this is just, you know, it's just another thing. Well, no, that other thing is robbing you of the energy you need to be able to do the more important stuff that you're accountable for. Um, you know, it can be relationships. You know, there are some relationships that are almost like there are people who are like psychic vampires, you walk into the room with them and it's like they just suck all of the energy out of you and out of the room. And yet you maintain those relationships, not because it's good for either one of you, but just because of because of momentum, because of inertia, because it's always been that way. Right. Yeah. History and culture. That's right. Exactly. And so are there people that you people that you need to prune from your life? Are there projects you need to prune from your life? Are there personal commitments you need to prune from your life? Um, and by the way, these might be really good things. 
that you need to prune. But you're pruning them not because they're bad things, but because you know that sometimes good things have to go away so something better can be born. So that would be my challenge for people with regard to energy is just recognize that energy management isn't just about getting rid of all the the unnecessary stuff, all the stuff that's you know that's obviously bad. Sometimes it means, no, I need to get rid of this project that I really care about because there's something better I need to be focusing my energy on. And I think this is a really important point because as we move into the future, we have more and more competing influences on our time. If you look back a hundred years ago, the things, the demands that we had in a day, the things that were pulling us in different directions, especially mentally, were minimal compared to what we have today. When you look at cell phones and you look at the different interactions that we have, and it's important now that we're intentional. That's one thing I pulled out from what you're saying is we need to be intentional about where our energy goes. The other thing that I wanted to talk to, and that is this fallacy of compartmentalization which is this dividing our life into buckets and how that's a fallacy. And I'm really big, Todd, on I believe we're whole life individuals. Who we are at work and who we are at home, they run into each other. And I want to talk about this fallacy of compartmentalization when it comes to energy. Yeah, so I, I do think that we tend to divide our life into these kind of hermetically sealed vaults, right? We think, oh, well, that's my work life. Oh, that's my my personal life or my family life. And oh, that's my you know, community service life. And that's my financial life. And that's my, you know, we, we think of all of these things as separate, but they're not separate. You sit right at the middle of every commitment you make. And so if you have a busy season at work, you need to be very mindful about personal commitments that you're making. Maybe this isn't the right season for you to coach your kids' little league team. Maybe this isn't the right season for you and your wife to decide to go away on vacation, right? Uh, maybe this isn't, or your 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 husband or your your whatever. You know, like maybe this is not the right time for you to do those things because. There's, you know, you sit at the center of all of your commitments. And so, but people often, they don't think about that. They don't think about rhythms. They don't think about how every area of their life affects their ability to be effective in every other area of their life. Maybe it's going to be a very busy personal season for you. And maybe that should define how you think about your work schedule. And maybe you need to negotiate with your manager and say, hey, I would like to perhaps cut a few hours now, but I will pick pick those hours back up later or whatever it is. But you have to be mindful about how every area of your life affects every other area. And so one very simple exercise I commonly have people do is I want you to write out every commitment that you've made in your life. It doesn't matter. Everything that somebody is counting on you to accomplish or counting on you to do or depending on you for and consider the places in your life where you have made commitments that are maybe even in conflict with one another. You don't even know how you're going to get all this done. And, and it's often the result of just not thinking through the fact that this commitment that I'm making to this friend to do this thing, you know, next week. Oh, by the way, that happens to fall directly in the middle of a huge project that I'm accountable for at work. Maybe not the best time. You know, I would love to do that, but I, I can't do that. I have to say no because there's something more important or, you know, vice versa. Maybe it's a, a commitment in your personal life and maybe you need to say, you know what, I'm not going to take on this discretionary project, this discretionary work right now because there's something very important that's happening that I want to be able to give my full energy to because that all of this is part of our body of work. We tend to think of our body of work as our job, but very few of us are going to remember or be remembered for the work that we do, right? We're going yeah. to be remembered for, uh, you know, the relationships that we had, how we develop people. I mean, I'm working on uh, a new project right now related to the next book that I'm doing, which is about leading creative people. And, you know, one of the things I'm trying to instill in people is to recognize, listen, you know, hey, great ad campaign. That was fantastic. Hey, great product you developed. Hey, that was a fantastic brand effort that you did there. That was great. Nobody's going to remember that in 10 years. Nobody. Nobody's going to remember that. What they're going to remember is how you led them. They're going to remember the impact that you had. They're going to remember the process. They're going to remember what those months or years of their life were like. That is the, the greatest impact we have is, is on the people around us. That's the legacy that we leave. And so as much as we love to get sucked into tasks and, and doing stuff, and, and, and we should, we should do our, our, bring our best effort to every project we work on, we have to recognize that that stuff that we're doing, as important as it feels right now, is going to be completely forgotten, most likely in 10 years. There are only a handful of, there are only a handful of people that are going to be remembered in a hundred years, right? Who are living right now. Um, and so, but, but in the moment it feels 
it feels essential to us. And so if we just take a couple of steps back and we realize, hey, all of this is connected and what kind of body of work do I really want to be building? It, it makes that pruning decision a lot easier. And so when you say yes to one thing, you're saying no to something else. And so my question to you, as we move into this day and age, I think that we're making decisions quicker. We're becoming conditioned. When you look at like social media, for example, and you're going through your feed and you could hit like so quickly, it's conditioning our minds to make snap judgments, to make snap decisions. And so as you talk to this, taking a step back and really thinking about what we're doing, I think we're really going against some of the conditioning that we've been either raised with or have come into culturally, and that is snap decisions. Do you see that as kind of an, an indicator or kind of a, a um, impact on what we're talking about? I do. I, th- I think that we are um, in an age of increasing awareness and decreasing understanding. And, uh, and that, I mean, it concerns me, frankly, because I think that we are, um, we are aware of more things. And so we believe that we know more things, but the reality is we don't see the patterns because to your point, we're moving from shiny object to shiny object. And because we're aware of it, we think that we think, Hey, look at this phone in my pocket. Look how amazing I am. (laughs) Right. It's like, well, you didn't, you didn't build that phone. You don't understand how that phone works. Right. But we tend to think that we're smart because collectively look at what we're accomplishing. Um, but I, I think that to some degree, I think we're more aware of things than we ever have been, but we're not really taking the time to understand. And, and my other concern about that, frankly, um, Jake, is that you know empathy takes time. It takes time and it takes sustained effort. You have to stop and think, I wonder what it feels like for that other person to, to be experiencing that. Um, let me think of a time in my life when I felt something like that. Oh yeah, that really felt terrible or, oh, that really felt great. Um, now let me ascribe that to the other person. Oh wow. Now I have a connection with that other person because I, I, I can empathize with them because I have had a similar experience and I know what it feels like. And so I can put myself in their shoes. Well, we are being trained on social media because we're being bombarded with all of this stuff. Like, oh yeah, that sucks. Okay, move on, right? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think there was a time when, you know, a handful of years ago when Puerto Rico would have wrecked me, absolutely would have wrecked me to think that there are people living without power and without water. And, you know, it, this is this is an unbelievable. And I would have been you know, really wrecked by that for, for probably for a a number of days or weeks, but because we're bombarded with this stuff so often now, and it's always moving on to the next news cycle, the next thing, it's really, I think we really are, are, are losing our sense of empathy. And so one of the, one, you know, one of the things that is really helpful is to, and I think I, I wrote about this in the book, but just this idea of, Hey, just disconnect, get away, you know, turn, uh, it's, it sounds crazy. It really sounds crazy, but Hey, turn your phone off just for a day on Saturday, just turn it off, get away. When are you unavailable? When are you unreachable? I mean, I'm, I'm old enough. I'm sort of of the generation that made the transition from nothing digital other than like businesses had computers, you know, kind of thing to like, Oh, okay. Now there are home computers, but you have to go to it and turn it on to, okay, now there's a home computer that's connected, but it's kind of like that dial up -up. thing. And it's like a pain. You can't really do anything to now I have a supercomputer in my pocket that lets me know anyone, be anywhere, see anything, know anything at a moment's notice anywhere around the world. There's it's instant gratification. So I've kind of made all of those stages of transition. And uh, last weekend I went camping with a group of guys and we, we were beyond cell phone coverage and we turned our phones off and we didn't have for, for like a day and a half or almost two days, no connection with the outside world. And I have to tell you, Jake, I came out of that I didn't have the jitters. I wasn't, you know, shaking. You know, when I came out, I, I felt free. I felt completely free. There were moments around the campfire where we were we were thinking like, okay, who was it that sang that song again? Uh, and we started to reach for our pocket and we're like, oh, we don't have our phones. Like, and that's okay. Let's just not know. That's okay. We don't have to know. <laughs> you know, we don't have to know who sang that. Um, but it was very freeing. And I think in some ways that, again, it's a matter of rhythm. There's nothing wrong with being on. There's nothing wrong with being connected. But do you ever have time in your life when you're disconnected, when you're unreachable, when you're unavailable, where you can get off the grid you're not looking at out there. You're just breaking away and thinking and developing your intuition and and honing your sense of who you are and um, and paying attention to your thoughts and connecting dots. You know, the other thing that concerns me, and sorry, I'm kind of going on here, but one of the things that concerns me too is that 
we are losing our ability to intuitively connect dots because we're constantly being bombarded by dots. Yes. So we would you would think that would make us more creative because we have more stuff coming in to our process. But the problem is we can't process all of that stuff unless we step back and we look for patterns. Well, we're not taking the time to break away and step back and look for patterns. And so I think every a lot of creative stuff right now is just it's kind of shallow. It's kind of uh, you know it's it's a little bit derivative because we're not really taking the time to step back and look at what's really going on and make those intuitive leaps that are necessary. And that requires breaking away. It requires uh, you know sort of an intentional process of looking for and connecting dots. And as Stephen Johnson calls it, pursuing the adjacent possible. And Einstein called it combinatory play, you know, playing with ideas. But to do that, you have to break away. And so our challenge for the listeners is to be intentional about unplugging and looking for patterns. Because if you're not intentional about it, if you don't schedule it and make it a priority, it's not going to happen. You're always going to reach for that phone or listen to that ping, or you're always going to check one last email. Now, Todd, I look at our time and there is so much in this book, The Accidental Creative (laughs) and your other three books that we want to dive into and, and learn more about. I wanted to talk about stimuli. I wanted to talk about hours, which are the currency of our productivity, but alas, our productivity and our hours are running short at this point. Before <laughs> we let you go and get back uh, on your airplane, you're, you're leaving soon. I want to ask you a few questions in a section that we call learning from leaders, which adds a little personal to this business discussion that we've been having. And it starts mm, with this. What book is currently on your Kindle or bedside table? I'm, I'm looking at it right now. I'm actually uh, reading Principles by Ray Dalio. Um, which just came out recently. Uh, some of you may know Ray Dalio is the the founder of Bridgewater Capital. Um, he wrote this uh, series of principles many years ago, and this kind of guided his company for a long time. And I actually read it when it was a PDF. Um, but he recently published Principles as a, a full fledged book, and it is really. Uh, really, I think a, a great distillation of some of the best ideas about what it means to pursue success that I've ever read. Uh, it's fantastic. And um, he gives a lot of great, um, very practical things that you can implement and, and consider in your own life. So I would, I would definitely recommend checking it out. It's called Principles by Ray Dalio. Wonderful. How about the best movie ever made? <laughs> um, I, I got to Boy, this is going to be so cliche. I'm sorry, but I've I've got to go with Braveheart. I think Braveheart is such a phenomenal movie, not because, uh, you know, argh, you know, war fighting, but because I think it really explores all of the emotional nuances of of uh, what what makes a good story. You've got, um, you know, you've got love, you've got uh, the underdog, you've got, um, you know, sort of the hero's journey of like having to go out and, and pursue this battle. You've got, uh, in the end, you've got martyrdom, this guy who dies for a cause and, um, and sparks a revolution. I think you've got all of the nuances that make for a, a great story all wrapped up in that one movie. So it's not because of the rah-rah or the, you know, sort of the, the typical things like that you would expect. But I think it's just because it, it really has all of the highs and lows and nuance. Uh, and I think the acting is phenomenal. So, yeah, I think Braveheart. Well, and I think that's great. And I love asking this question because, you know, I heard a quote the other day that I thought was so funny and so true. And that is, my life is like a drama without the music to tell me how to fill. And I love movies (laughs) because they have this music and this inspiration and it tells us kind of, it takes us down the path. How about your leadership superpower? Uh, I think that my leadership superpower is intuition. Um, I am often in a meeting where I'm able to connect dots and, uh, you know, it seems to be something that I do really well. I'm able to kind of see patterns when other people seem to be distracted. So I think that's probably the thing that I bring to most meetings that I'm in is my ability to intuit. I think that's awesome. And finally, the best business book ever written. Uh, the best business book ever written. Besides um, Accidental Creative. <laughs> uh yeah i boy um i would say if you if you were shifting that slightly i would say the book that's had the most impact on me is man's search for meaning by victor frankel yes um and i know a lot of people say that um but probably i mean frankly i've got to, i mean the best business book ever written um i've got to go with good to great by jim collins yeah i think that um it is the best researched and probably the the one thing that i judge a business book by is how many 
phrases does it introduce into the culture that become just assumed phrases, right? So like uh, the flywheel is an example of that. The hedgehog is an example, you know, like BHAG was from, you know, built to last, but still like, you know, I've, I've heard BHAG used so many big, hairy, audacious goal used so many times. Uh, the idea of the doom loop. The level five leader. Level five leader, you know, put the right people in the right seat on the bus, you know, yeah. uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. Like you, you hear these phrases being thrown out and you have no idea where they come from, but they all come from this one thing, this one book. And so I think you have to judge a book by how many memes it sort of introduces that become the way that leaders think about what they do. And so I've, I've got to go with good to great. And again, it's kind of the cliche, right? But I, I think that it's a cliche for a reason. And we are huge fans of Jim Collins. My favorite book, good, uh, Great by Choice, written by Jim Collins as well. Well, that's another one that fire, fire bullets, then cannonballs, right? Like you hear people saying that now and it's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. But you know, it's like, you don't realize that comes from this book. And, uh, yeah, he is, he is like a meme factory, that guy, like he just, or an idiom factory. So like, he just has the ability to put these things out that become cultural norms. It's incredible. Well, and if we had more time going into your book, I think he does some of the practices as far as intentionality, putting the right stimuli in. They take time to write those books and it shows, you know, he's not putting this out in three months. This is years of work and you can tell. Todd, our time is up. I really appreciate you being with us today. Before we let you go, any last bit of advice and how can we find out more about you, pick up The Accidental Creative and your other three books? Yeah, I would just encourage you that, um, remember you are steering the ship, right? Uh, don't allow your life and your leadership and your career to be dictated by what you think other people expect from you. If you don't know who you are and what you want, you will end up in a place that is confusing and frightening to you. And you'll say, how did I get here? So, um, you know, I just encourage you to, to know yourself, to spend the time necessary to break away and to get to know yourself and to recognize that, um, you know, the most important thing about your body of work is that you're navigating toward something that matters to you. And it doesn't matter if it matters to everybody else, but it matters to you. And so uh, I just encourage you to have that as a framework for decisions. If you want to, uh, to get a hold of me, you can find me at toddhenry.com. That's my personal site. It's probably the best way to find me or listen to the Axiom Creative Podcast because we put out an episode or two every week and have been doing it for 12 years. And I will link all of that up on the show notes. Todd, you're one of my favorite authors. I love what you have to teach. You're prolific. You're brilliant. You've done what the Accidental Creative teaches. Thank you for spending this morning with us. Thanks, Jake. How cool was that? It was so awesome to sit down with Todd. Like I mentioned to him, he's one of my favorite authors. I like his style of writing. He's got a kind of a Jim Collins approach where he writes a lot about stories and he brings them all into this well-researched background, creativity, problem solving. We're all creatives. In today's world, if we're not solving problems, we're being left behind. And so I think this book is an absolute must read. It was so great to have it as the book club book this month and great to have Todd on the show. A couple of big pullouts that I had from this episode that I wanted to share with you. We live in a world of increasing awareness and decreasing understanding. What does that mean? Well, it means that we are surface informed. And I got to give you an example of this. Oftentimes I'll say to my wife, oh, did you hear about the earthquake in so-and-so? Or did you hear about the shooting that happened in such and such? And she'll ask me details and I'll say, well, actually, I don't know. I just saw the headline. I'm just scrolling through my feed, USA Today or Facebook, and I come across these titles, these surface level information And that becomes all the information that I have. And so what I want to challenge us to do is take a step back and be intentional about what we're learning, what we're putting into our heads and knowing, understanding what is going on out there, the influences and the things that we are learning, because it will help our creativity. It will help our problem solving. The second thing that I wanted to pull out, and that is empathy takes time. It takes an intentionality. We need to be focused on what we're trying to accomplish, pruning out those people in our lives that we don't need or things in our lives, those activities that we don't need, and adding more of the stuff that's really good for us, that's helping us move along our path. We closed with that challenge to step back, unplug, be intentional about unplugging, and really looking for patterns, connecting those dots in your life. 
Again, thanks to Todd for coming on the show. Really had a good time with him. Of course, all that we talked about, the show notes for this episode, the quotes, the books, everything is over on the website, jakeacarlson.com slash ml46 for episode 46. And with that, I want to wish you the best of days, an even better life. Be creative and stay awesome. Thanks for listening to the Modern Leadership Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at Speaker Jake, on Twitter at Jake A. Carlson, and of course the website, jakeacarlson.com. See you there. Bye.